so thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time at MedEx. And I'm happy to be here to tell you about this platform, this community that we created about two years ago, uh, called Patient Innovation, as you just mentioned, that basically in two years grew up to be a community of about 40,000 people around the globe that share with us solutions that they develop to help them cope with their diseases. And in about two years, we have now a portfolio of 650, more or less, uh, which means on average we have 1.5 per day that we actually uh, look at. And because it's healthcare, we have to medical screen them before we share them. So I'll tell you more about this, and let me tell you the things we are talking about. So if we start from the beginning, I'm basically a researcher in the field of open and user innovation. And what I care about is the role of people in developing new solutions. People like Tails Gordorfi. Tails was one of the guys that we first met. I mean, this guy in 2002 went to see his doctor, and the doctor told him that because of his condition, he was at risk of dying. And, you know, the bad news here was because of his uh, Marfan syndrome situation, basically tall, very big guy, uh, uh, with an aorta that is not strong enough for the flow of blood that goes through it. So, you know, we know Tol very well. I'm sure he went home saying bad things about the doctor. How can he tell me that I'm going to die because of this? Because, basically, the problem was the aorta could have some sort of rupture that, you know, the doctors could not fix. So basically, when this happened, uh, Toll was so upset that went home thinking about this and realized that he should do something, which he did. He started working at home in developing this aortic support that you see here so that he could put this thing around the world. Of course, this is something he could not do alone at home, so he walked back to his doctor's office a couple of months later and asked the doctor to help him putting this thing in, right? I don't recommend to do this stuff at all. So there we go. In 2004, he convinced the doctor to actually put this thing in, and here we are, 12 years later. And not only Tail is alive, but in fact, he saved his own life and the life of 60, sorry, 76 other people that have received the same aortic support. So, I mean, as a researcher in the field of user innovation, when I found this, I was really intrigued. And then we start looking at different solutions, like Amit Gopher from Israel. Amit got paralyzed in a car accident, so he couldn't move anything below the neck. I mean, Amit is the guy that actually developed the most, develop, the most advanced exoskeleton that you'll find out there in the market. It's now uh, in the market in the US, for instance, as it is in Israel. Uh, it's an expensive toy that costs $85,000. Think about it. What's new here is that suddenly it's the patient is developing the solution. It's not even co-creation. In some cases, in fact, they do it all. I mean, at some point, we met Louis Plant. Louis is a cystic fibrosis patient. Uh, you probably know a bit about this condition. It's complicated, but one of the problems is that they need to clean their lungs in a way uh, that it's not very sophisticated. At the time, most of the solutions that were out there to clean the lungs were based on the so-called ketchup bottle principle. So how do you take the ketchup out of the bottle? You know, you shake it, you clap it, you turn it upside down. That's exactly what we did to kids for a long time, right? It's really bad. It tells me, you know, we have no idea how bad it is because, of course, these uh, patients are, 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 are patients, which means sometimes their body is hurting. At some point, after a lung transplant, he was really in a bad condition and he was, uh, you know, having the need of doing these four hours per day, four treatments of one hour every day. And he tells me it's really excruciating. It hurts so much that it's really, really bad. And what happened to him was really interesting, because one day he went to a concert. And in this concert, he realized that when the musicians played, he would start coughing. And then the musician stopped playing, and he would stop coughing. Hmm. And he thought this was interesting. Actually, it was embarrassing at the same time, because this was classical music. And in a concert, we are supposed to be silent. And, you know, Louis basically says people start giving weird looks, and uh, uh, things got even worse because as then the amount of the music increased, 
you know, uh, I start coughing more and suddenly uh, at the break I was absolutely fine and people were looking at me saying, you know, it's the break, now we will expect you to be doing all the coughing and you are fine. Uh, you know, uh, after the break the thing got even worse because uh, again he had to leave the concert with a huge crisis of speculation. And he went on thinking about this to realize that this was happening because he was sitting in front of the speakers. What was going on was that the speakers were actually sending the music vibrations towards his lungs, shaking the entire body, including the lungs, therefore creating this discomfort. So this was actually bad, but it was good at the same time, because, you know, shaking the lungs and losing the mucus from the lungs, it's exactly what he needs to do every day. So at home, he started thinking about this and realized that he could give it a try and try if using speakers would work for him. So he would put speakers in front of the lungs and now control the type of music that in fact would work better for him. He even tells him that in fact he realized that the type of music that works better for this, it's not music that he really likes to hear, which means he decided that he could try to cut the sound and just leave the vibrations. You know, making a long story short, we developed the frequency, the solution that you see here, and basically it's one of the solutions that patients of cystic fibrosis can use now to clear the legs. Again, what's new here? I mean, what's new here is that it's a very interesting technology that was developed by a patient, right? And when in fact we were asked by other solutions for this in a review to a paper, we went out there and found a lot of interesting solutions that doctors were recommending to their patients. And then we concluded that many of those had indeed been developed by the patients themselves or sometimes by the caregivers. And I'll explain what that means in a second. You know, sometimes it's the mother that actually sees that jumping in trampolines, it's a good idea for a kid. Or here, David Day from the UK developed this game for her daughter to actually uh, play games, computer games, and instead of um, uh, using the mouse, he, she uses a system that he developed uh, so that she controls the computer by blowing into these things. I mean, and we found about 10 solutions that had been developed either by patients or by caregivers, sometimes against the recommendation of the doctor. I mean, Emily Eger is well known because she, in fact, uh, uh, sort of suggested that uh, surfing was a good thing for her. And of course, you know, surfing is something that doctors don't recommend to patients of cystic fibrosis, but the story goes like this. You know, she's from Australia. She was uh, doing really bad uh, at some point when uh, all the 24 medicines that she was taking every day were not really helping her much and she decided that she would uh, go back and do surfing, something that her doctor told her not to do. She realized that while surfing, she was actually very comfortable. So at some point, she finally said this to her doctor. And basically, uh, he realized that it made a lot of sense because what was going on was that the salted water plus the vibration were helping her clean the airways. So he actually became famous because he published a paper at the New England Journal of Medicine su suggesting the use of saline waters for cleaning the airways. You see, I mean, it's inter interesting, right? Because we see a lot of solutions out there. Michael Sears from this community developed this uh, sensor for his um, ostomy bag, right? Because, you know, these patients don't really have a nice system to tell them when the bag is full. So, there we go. I mean, Again, nobody else fixed the problem but the patient. And in our research, we were finding all sorts of cases. Uh, again, I told you about 650 stories like this that I could tell you. Uh, sometimes from the patients, other times from the caregivers. Caregivers like uh, Keely's father. You know, when Keely had to do chemotherapy, her father realized that she would need to be stuck to one of these supports that, of course, they use in hospitals. Uh, this is actually not very nice for, for these kids. So he realized that maybe he could 
instead of having a support like this, adapt this to a backpack so that now she could walk around and do her treatment, of course, with some, some more freedom than she used to have. Or, or, or Debbie, Debbie from Israel, this is, she is the mother of a kid with cerebral palsy. Uh, you know, it's a complicated problem, but one of the things is that when these kids are supposed to stand, stand up and walk, they simply don't have the muscles, the energy, the motivation to do that. So she developed this system, this device, that attaches her son to the foot and then to the rest of the body, it's sort of like a jacket that they wear, now the kids can actually walk. I mean, we found a lot of examples everywhere and also in Portugal. For instance, this is a very simple case we found in my country uh, where Joaquina, uh, the mother of a kid with Engelmann syndrome, again, a complicated disease that, among other problems, has this thing that when kids are supposed to stand up and walk, they simply don't do it. And, you know, Gonzalo, her son, was already seven years and he couldn't walk. And she was really worried because she was trying all sorts of things from the medical system solutions to her own solutions. Nothing seemed to work. And one Saturday afternoon, she went to a party, to a birthday party, where there were a lot of helium balloons, like the ones that you see here. And to her surprise, you know, her son got all excited and started jumping to get the balloons. And when she saw that, she realized, oh, I mean, I have a simple solution here, which is, let me go and buy balloons. So she went shopping, right? She didn't even spend a lot of money. She bought about 100 balloons, and she spread the balloons around her house. Now the balloons were floating around. And the next thing she did was to, you know, let the kid go on. And shortly after, you know, first the kid was super tired, jumping from balloon to balloon. Shortly after, she realized that her son was finally walking. You see, when we start sharing this solution in my talks, we start getting a lot of feedback from people that would tell me, look, that's so interesting, thanks for sharing, because you know, my son has the same disease or a different disease, and in fact, I realized that this works. So there was what we call a diffusion problem. And we know this from innovation. Quite often, you know, innovation does not reach people, right? I mean, what we found out in one of the papers that we did with Eric Vanipel at MIT and a few doctors in Portugal was this paper in which we surveyed 500 patients in Portugal. These were, in fact, rare disease patients. We called them. We asked them if they had ever developed anything new. And, in fact, a very big percentage said yes. In fact, it was 36%, 28 plus 8. And we were like, wow, that's a lot. So let's not go so fast. So what we did afterwards was to have a team of medical doctors to actually look at the solutions. And what, in fact, we found was that 28% of those solutions that the patients thought were new were not really new to the doctors. Even if they were good, they were not new to the doctors. But still, 8%, which means 40 out of 500 randomly picked patients in a patient association in Portugal had developed something that, according to our literature, is considered new to the world. Think about it. It's huge, right? 8%, it's huge. Because innovation is relatively rare. If 8% of the patients out there, in fact, develop something new, suddenly we are talking about, we are talking about a big phenomenon. I mean, what else did we find? We found that these solutions, in fact, were contributing very significantly to the quality of life of these patients or caregivers. In a five-point scale, we realized that the quality of life of patients was increasing two points, and the quality of life of caregivers was increasing 1.9 points. So this was very relevant. What was the problem? I mean, the problem is that these solutions were not going anywhere. Basically, only 5% of the patients were even, actually patients that had developed solutions that were new to the world, only 5% had shared these solutions with their doctors. 5%. Almost nothing, right? So there's a diffusion problem that we mentioned before. And what we thought is that we could probably try to help fix the problem. I mean, this was going to be mostly a research experiment when we decided to create a platform out there for people to share what they did. We called it patient innovation, and we launched it two and a half years ago, more or less. 
And this is what happened. It, I told you about 650, and that's because, in fact, we have approved only about 50% of the solutions. Uh, we have now about 650 medically approved solutions. When I say medically approved, I need to be careful here. It's medically screened. We developed a protocol. Of course, we are not talking about clinical trials. It's just that we don't deal at the moment with drugs, topic products, things that you have to eat or drink. We cannot deal with that. So it's mostly uh, devices or techniques for people to cope with their disease. This has been the growth rate. We have now solutions from over 40 countries. In fact, um, the US is the main contributor, followed by Portugal, England, Brazil, and, and Australia. And it makes sense that these are the top five, because in the beginning, the platform was only available only in Portuguese and English. Now we have increased the number of languages, and we see Germany coming six, Israel, etc., etc. So uh, this is what happened in the past uh, uh, two years. And we were also surprised by something that certainly does not surprise this community, with the amount of makers that, in fact, start collaborating in our project, people like Ivan Owen. I mean, you probably have heard about this man that at some point, uh, for his job, is a puppeteer from Seattle, developed this end that you see up here. And he put that on a YouTube file, right? It's an end that is mechanical, it moves, and he put that on a YouTube, and he was really intrigued because he immediately got an email from a guy in South Africa saying, look, I saw what you posted, doesn't look very sophisticated, but you know, I'm a carpenter, I used to have five fingers, then the machine just shot three of them. And it's not nice. You see, I wanted to have a real prosthetic, but I cannot afford one. The thing you did looks really cheap. I could probably have one of those, in particular if you help me doing one that I can wear. And there we go. I mean, Ivan started helping uh, Richard Vanas and developing uh, a prosthetic for him. He then found us, uh, and this is just a picture of Nuno, a Portuguese guy that in fact had this prosthetic that was developed by us in my office during the weekend. And you know, this prosthetic costs now about 18 euros, what, $25 at most? That's the cost in terms of materials of doing something like this. So uh, how can we do something like this? Well, we can do something like this because third Certainly, uh, makers from different parts of the globe are sharing the code. And if you have a local printer, if you have the problem, the, the, the local problem, uh, you can certainly adapt uh, uh, the, the, the solution to a kid. So this is Nunu. And we have seen a lot of that in our platform, too, which to some extent has been surprising. This is uh, our team when we produced him, uh, when we produced the, the, the prosthetic. This is me doing arm wrestling with Nunu, which I won. Uh, and you know, lots of good things have happened to us. Uh, uh, for instance, at some point, United Nations called us. Uh, uh, they invited us to a meeting in New York, saying we are very excited about this project. It's something they posted on their website. Or we participated in this competition at Harvard, in which we got more votes than any other of the seven, 475 projects that participated as well. Uh, it was very nice because we were the only non-US project that was semi-finalist. And if I want to brag, if, if you allow me to brag a little bit, we, in fact, we got five times more votes than the second project got, that got more votes. We've got 26,000 votes, which was nice. You know, the European Commission in Europe called us a startup to follow. And this is interesting because we are not even a startup. We are just a non-profit project, uh, and we don't intend to sell any of these things. You know, other nice things have happened to us, like this exhibition that the Science Museum in London is doing now about our project. Uh, this was last summer, last Christmas, sorry, when they called us and said, you know, we would like to do an exhibition about you. And that was nice on one side, but then they said, you know, it's about your innovations. And the nice thing is that this is going to be in London, and it's also going to travel to 29 countries across Europe. In fact, we are opening today, as we speak, uh, in, in Luxembourg. Uh, so this is going to be very nice for increasing the visibility of our project in Europe. 
Other nice things is that we recently were at the World Government Summit, which was very good again to increase the visibility of the of the of the project. I mean, media coverage has been nice in some countries. In Africa, where people are excited because uh, it seems that we are helping some countries already meet the sustainable development goals, according to some authors. So this has been, thanks to this team, a small team in Lisbon of students, my students. Of course, it's an interdisciplinary uh, research team with some medical doctors too. And then, you know, an advisory board that includes several Nobel laureates, people that basically approached us and said, you know, this is a cool project, I would like to help. And that's how we could get uh, uh, some of these people on board. I mean, according to my mentor, Eric Van Nippel at MIT, what we are doing here makes a lot of sense. Well, thanks God, right? Uh, so on one side, what Eric realized a long time ago was that there is innovation in, camp in companies, but there's also what he calls before user innovation. Now we are looking at a particular type of innovation, which is innovation in healthcare. And what we see here is that, of course, you know, patients innovate, but they also face a lot of problems. I mean, sometimes they don't have the design skills that they would need to develop a given device. Uh, for sure, they don't know how to diffuse the innovation. So all these problems can actually be, sometimes we call them market failures, can be fixed. To some extent, what a platform like ours is helping to do is to fix some of these issues, right? Uh, because people don't have the skills. If you actually uh, have a platform like this that has the problem there, others can jump in and try to help. That's what we have seen with lots of 3D printing enthusiasts that have been uh, contributing to some of these solutions. Not to mention the diffusion. I mean, it would be hard to believe that a solution could reach uh, all the countries of the globe. Well, we don't necessarily reach all the countries, but we know that we have users across the five continents, and even the solutions that we have right now are from more than 40-something countries. So uh, this is what we have been doing, and what we are doing now, because patients are asking us to do that, is to actually help some of these patients to further develop the solutions and bring them to market. In fact, many of these patients want to become entrepreneurs. So, if you will, our dream would be to create an ecosystem of companies, maybe based in Lisbon, but pretty much virtual, companies that are created or co-created by patients or caregivers. So that's what we are working on at the moment. And that's what I wanted to tell you. You know, this is a quote from one of our board of the uh, advisory board members, uh, Richard Roberts, who got the Nobel Prize, which says that this is an outstanding use of social media that should help many disadvantaged people. And of course, I'm quoting him because I believe he's right. So thank you.